Hi, and welcome. Uh, this is the second round of Lightning Talks, um, which are quick five-minute talks. Um, we are going to go through all of the talks first, and then at the end, we will take questions for any of the talk speakers. Uh, so first off, we are going to start uh, with Jury Vlasic, uh, who will be speaking uh, about Divide and Map which is a project to help mappers divide a big area into smaller squares. Uh... Hi, my name is Yuri Vlasak and I will talk about Divide and Map now, the demon project. If you have a large area you would like to map, usually you divide it up to small squares and let mappers map and you are done. If this sounds familiar, uh, then you probably know what Tasking manager. Personally, I don't like it much. They use proprietary software, they don't listen to community, and still they have performance issues. What would be the better solution? Divide up functionality. That would support multiple clients. Uh, it would increase the developing, uh, developers and communication efficiency, and it would make the thing simpler. I will be concrete. There is running instance of the daemon project. It's server. Uh, there is web client for mappers. There are, there are two clients for managers. Uh, the JSON plugin and deployment guide. Because you don't need to be a developer to run your own instance. And because I am very forgotful, there is a step-by-step -step guide how to run a particular tasks for deploy the demon project. I did a load testing for currently running instance, and the result is that there is no error for 100 people on Mapathon. So the demon project. Keep mapping, guys. Live. Next, uh, we have uh, Harrison Cole. Uh, who will speak about mapping historically black colleges and universities, um, which uh, are, uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar, are a group of schools uh, in the United States uh, that were established uh, specifically for black Americans. Um, and uh, historically, these uh, institutions have not been as well mapped in OSM as they're predominantly white, uh, the institutions are predominantly white. Um, and there is an effort to... Uh... Hi, my name is Harrison Cole. I'm a PhD candidate at Penn State University. Uh, I'll be talking about mapping historically black colleges and universities and OpenStreetMap, um, as well as giving you some information uh, for uh, if you want to contribute to this work as well. So HBCUs, as they're also called, are schools that were established prior to 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, before that, most universities in the U.S. had admissions policies that barred people of color from being enrolled. Um, so these schools were established in response to that. Um, a lot of them are still around. They only comprise about 10% of the total number of institutions, uh, uh, universities in the US, but 25% of black Americans who graduated college did so through an HBCU. So they're a pretty important part of our social uh, infrastructure. That being said, the US has historically systemically neglected uh, primarily black spaces um, whether they're residential areas or commercial areas, and uh, HBCUs aren't immune to that. Um, it extends to being mapped as well. Um, so most of them are in the South, 
a few in the, the Midwest, um, but that's primarily where they're they're located geographically. Um, this spreadsheet on the right that you can see, uh, this was created. Um, it, it has a list of HBCUs in the U.S. This is pretty broadly defined, depending on who you talk to. Um, it, the, a list of HBCUs might only include those that are uh, still accredited or only are funded through a particular grant program. Um, but this list was deliberately defined very broadly because um, we wanted to make sure that all schools were accounted for, or at least as many as possible. Um, it also includes information about uh, the extent to which each campus is mapped. Um, it could be anywhere from uh, being being micro mapped, it has all the sidewalks and pathways and parking lots and everything, um, all the way down to just being a label. Um, maybe it has the outline of, of the university grounds. Um, as an example, this is Grambling State University. Uh, as you can see, there's the track, uh, a few labels for like the gym and dining hall, but that's kind of it. Um, and uh, after uh, a few days, this is what it looked like. Um, there's most of the the main buildings have been mapped, not all of them. Um, parking has been included, a lot of the amenities. Uh, so there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done on uh, a lot of these campuses. A couple more examples. Um, this is Kentucky State University. This is actually uh, after um, a couple of people have been working on it. So a lot of the buildings that you can see here uh, weren't there previously. Uh, this is after a day or two of work. Uh, this is Miles College, same thing. Um, almost nothing here is mapped. You have the, the main building near the, the um, northernmost part of the campus, but it's kind of it. Um, now we have the sidewalks, pathways, uh, buildings that aren't obviously part of the campus, but legally still are, um, have been mapped as well. So um, where do we go from here? This is, this is a great start, but uh, HBCUs need to be involved in this project. Um, as far as I know right now, um, there isn't anybody doing this work who is directly connected to an HBCU. I could be wrong, but um, I'm, I'm not aware of it. So uh, we need to make sure that they're um, uh, involved in this process as much as possible. Um, and of course, continue working. There's still a whole lot of stuff that needs to be mapped. Um, a lot of micro mapping still needs to be done where certain like statue locations are, trees, bike share stations, things like that. Um, and then afterwards, uh, or simultaneously, tribal colleges, universities, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, these are all places that also need to be mapped. Um, and uh, similarly seem to have been uh, neglected relative to uh, other larger uh, universities in the US. So if you want to contribute to this, uh, this is the URL that you can visit, tiny.cc slash HBCUOSM. Um, that's the spreadsheet that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it has a list of all the HBCUs in the US, and uh, you can just pick one and, and start mapping. Um, and uh, that'll be it for me. Thanks. live and next up we have jose montes uh with ddd123 osm uh, which is a tool set uh for generating 3d models from openstreetmap data Well, hello, welcome to this talk, uh, DDD OpenStreetMap uh, 2D and 3D Render Tool Chain. I hope you are all doing well and enjoying it. My name is Jose Juan Montes. I'm a software engineer from Galicia, Spain, and the developer of the tool I'm introducing today. I've been recently working on a tool that generates 3D models from OpenStreetMap data, and I'd like to share the, some of the results and the status with you. I was building this tool for our game, Your City Racing, which is what you can see now on the screen. 
Um, this is an adventure racing game which will allow players to drive around cities based from open street map data. Um, we plan to build several European and American cities initially and in the future we'd like to allow players to choose any location they like. We plan to make your city racing uh, available for Linux, Windows and Mac, so if you like the idea, please follow us on Twitter and help us spread the news. Back to the story. Um, a few months ago I was working on a hobby project, a um, tool which uh, simplified the task of programming procedurally generated 3D things. And I meant to use this to generate uh, very simple 3D things for games like this one. Um, this was one of the first scenes produced uh, as a proof of concept for a simple crazy golf game. So you can, for instance, grab a CSV of the periodic table and quickly program the generation of a 3D scene like this one. So uh, this experience um, allowed me to quickly prototype a generation pipeline for OpenStreetMap data. And this is what I came up with. Um, and fast forward a few few months and today this tool set looks like like this at the bottom of the stack we have a this 2d 3d generation tool called the ddd and it's a python package built on top of well-known libraries such as numpy shapely and trimesh among others so um what can we do with it um we try to be um, quite representative at ground level, so this includes generating sidewalks with curves, uh, irregular ground and park areas, um, having some model variety, trying to align objects like benches, sensibly represent traffic signs, traffic lights, business signs, urban props. So. Um, Currently, all the stuff is procedurally generated, which means that we can support tags like surf, surface materials, height or width for stuff like trees, lamps or benches. Um, we are also aiming to create correctly snap geometry, including tunnels and bridges, um, so they can be effectively used, for example, in the context of a physics simulation. Um, we can easily style different elements in both 2D and 3D stages, so this allows the DD to output vector or raster files with the 2D representation along different stages, as you can see here. And you can then inspect the generated files. The DD aims to maintain full OpenStreetMap to 3D traceability. So for every object, uh, way or piece of geometry, we can see the metadata, um, OSM ID, OSM tags, and also the generation process data, or debugging for process. And I'd like to show you a couple of examples of customizations to the pipeline that have been written with just... Uh, the first one is the integration of auto photos, using them as textures laid on the surface, surface area and they are dynamically retrieved from a WMS service and in this case they are um, used to replace floor textures. And the next one is a mapillary integration. Um, here we add a couple of steps. Um, here we have a few examples of the vector output uh, um, process with uh, Inkscape. Okay, so wrapping up, this is the current list of features uh, of the DDD OpenStreetMap pipeline. So, what is this today? Um, well, um, the software is not quite mature enough, uh, and the API is not fully consistent, so it's expected to change. Um, but I think that this tool and the paradigm may be useful in areas like infographics, civil engineering, architecture, games, and simulators, artificial intelligence. So let me know what you think. I do not currently have a Patreon page, but I do plan to look for patrons or parties interested in sponsoring this development and the related services. Uh, anyhow, if I wish to be able to, as soon as possible, publish a basic online viewer 
and service that allows people to navigate at least a set of predefined areas. And in the end, I'd like to see an infrastructure with uh, global coverage. Following your city game Twitter account or buying the game when it comes out also helps. Um, that's all. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you liked it. Hive. So next up, uh, we have uh, Enoch Seth uh, Nayamador, who will be speaking about uh, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, uh, OSGEO, and their projects that are working with OSM data. Hello, and welcome to uh this uh, quick uh, lightning talk on OSU and OSM. My name is Enoch Seth Nyamado and uh, I'm with the OSU Marketing Committee and an open street map contributor for the past uh, years uh, from Ghana. Now this presentation is to get you up to speed about uh, OSU and how it's connected to open street map and how OSM community is also connected to OSU. So OSU simply is the open source geospatial foundation uh, which believes in uh, promote free open uh, self-organizing and it's a global community as well. Now, OSU was started way back in 2006. Uh, yeah, OSM was in existence in 2004, and then it's a community and uh, driven by the need to organize and then uh, navigate rapidly around the growing field of open source uh, geospatial projects. Uh, founding members uh, included GDAL, Map Server, QGIS, Grass, and POSIUS. This is the initial logo of uh, OSU. Yeah, some uh, OSU projects, uh, friends and uh, family. Now, uh, OSU projects love OSM data is uh, no doubt and is a fact. And GDAL, which is uh, one of the libraries uh, that is used in both commercial and open source uh, software such as QGIS uh, and uh, many others, uh, has out of the box support for OSM data with uh, PBF, uh, OSM files, and etc. Open layers and uh, leaflet has uh, OSM support. Uh, OSM based services use uh, um, this. Uh, such as a base map and uh, for example is map bender which uses uh, OSM uh, as a base map and then PG routing uh, which is uh, uh, which makes massive use of OSM data for its analysis and then for its uh, um, process. Now OSM users also love OSU projects uh, which uh, is interesting and uh, most of uh, our OSM data that we get into OpenStreetMap is uh, reusing QGIS uh, and many other variety of uh, OSU projects for um, analysis. Uh, yeah, OSU membership is open, free, and uh, it's um, over 5,600 members uh, registered on the wiki. This uh, might not reflect the right number of uh, actual membership uh, down to... Uh, this cannot be compared to uh, OSM's uh, uh, membership, that is registration there from uh, the statistics. is quite old from 2019, might be more than this uh, now. And uh, always, uh, Joe has uh, charter members, uh, which he elects a board of directors. And uh, these chartered members are uh, to become a chartered member. You community member have served, done something which is worth mentioning. And the charter members also nominate you as well. The local chapters, over 30 um, plus around the world and globally, these chapters uh, organize uh, regional conferences for 4G co sprint and uh, also contribute to other projects uh, as well. Yeah, local chapters how are they connected to OSM? Yeah, in uh, Germany, uh, Force for G, Force G's EV is uh, the local chapter for OSU and the official local chapter for OSMF uh, in uh, Germany. As well, telling you that yeah, Force G's and OSM is a good uh, combination, uh, but uh, there are different, uh, maybe different interests, but yeah, it's the same uh, OS, uh, OSU OSM combination. So, yeah, Force for G, which is a conference uh, that is free on open source software for you, for you special conference that takes place uh, annually or regionally is a uh, combination of uh, OSM and OSU. Yeah, at this conference you meet a developer, talk about a uh, new feature in software X, Y, and Z, and also talk about use cases. Often uh, most Force 4G is about uh, um, oh, Force 4G tools, so you're using OSU, uh, OSM data for a use case as well. And then uh, these regional conferences are also about uh, 
OSU and um, OSM. So it's uh, beyond software, open source, open data, open standards, open science. And uh, we signed MOOS, uh, that is a memorandum of understanding. Yeah. Started way back in 2011 and uh, we signed by ICA and then other institutions as well. Um, Youth Mappers uh, forming part of the OpenStreetMap community and many more. Yeah, uh, you might ask why doesn't OSM uh, sign the uh, MOU? Yeah, OSM, in OSM we don't do sign of uh, memorandum of understanding and so uh, OSM falls within um, the category of uh, like-minded organizations and then uh, we are friends already and we promote uh, and use same tools and we love each other's projects. Yeah, where is your life which is uh, a full-blown uh, Linux distribution based on Ubuntu uh, is uh, uh, contains uh, OSM data for uh, wherever efforts for this is going to take place for the next release and uh, uh, you try it, it has a lot of tons of uh, uh, open source tools, uh, QGs and uh, it's uh, it's good, interesting. Uh, try it. Uh, yeah, OSU and OSM is a great combination. And uh, let the force uh, be with you. Enjoy uh, State of the Map 2020. Thank you. And next up, we have Willie Marcel, uh, who will be giving us a tour of uh, the latest version of Tasking Manager, Tasking Manager 4, which was just released in April. Hello, I'm Willie. I am a developer working for Hot, the humanitarian of the CityMap team. And today I will do a little tour on the Task Manager 4. The Task Manager 4 was released on April this year with a new, a completely new interface and a lot of changes on the API to make Task Manager perform faster. Here we have the list of projects and each project has a card with some information and we can also interact with the map and filter here the project list. We have some possibilities of other filters like filter by campaigns, by organizations or by locations. Here we have the project overview page uh, with a completely new map that shows uh, each task with a, call, a different color for it to each status. We have some information about the project like uh, the elements that needs to be mapped and some stats about the project. We have the project description, the organization that is coordinating it, the permissions, uh, comments, list of contributors and the timeline. Click on the contribute button will redirect us to that page where we have the instructions on how to map the project and also the same map with a legend showing what means it color on the map. So we have a task list that allows us to interact with the tasks. We can do that interaction both clicking on the map or selecting the tasks on the task list. One new thing is that you can select multiple tasks for validation by just clicking on the blue map, on the blue tasks. So uh, another new thing that we have is that we can use the ID editor inside the task manager. So you don't need to go out to the opposite map website to map or validate a project. So here in the ID editor integrated with on task manager, you can map uh, as you do it on the Obsidian Map website. So let's map here a new building and tag this which has building. So let's save that edit. And after I save it and select if the task is completely mapped or not, I can submit it. 
in that case I could not map everything so I will say no and submit the task so update the status of the, ta of the task and showing more some new features that we have uh, here on the my stats page you can see some statistics about the contributions of the user on task manager like the number of hours spent the number of elements mapped a timeline some other stats um, and some information about the location of the projects that the user has contributed we have a lot of changes as well on how we manage the project we have added the teams and organizations uh, that makes it possible to a group of users manage a project and also handle better the permissions with uh, creating teams for the users and associating it to the project so uh, I invite you to make a try on mapping on task manager and help us map for people in need And next up, we have uh, uses of mapping um, to assist to community care during the COVID-19 situation in the Philippines, uh, presented by Andy Tabinas. This is how mental health in the Philippines looks like, according to the latest available data, which was from way back in 2016. And this is how the current COVID-19 situation here looks like. The World Health Organization and public health governments and services around the world are acting to contain the COVID-19 outbreak. However, this time of crisis is generating stress throughout the population. In any epidemic, it is common for individuals to feel stressed and worried. And as the coronavirus pandemic has swept across the world, it has induced and still induces a considerable degree of fear, worry, and stress in the population at large. These are normal responses to our perceived or real threats or when we are faced with uncertainty or the unknown. So with COVID-19, the main psychological impact to date is elevated rates of stress and anxiety. I'm Andy Tabinas, a geospatial scientist and civil servant here in the Philippines, and I'm here to share with you how our volunteer organization, which is one of the hot OSM micrograntees for 2020, was able to utilize maps and OSM data to provide community care during the pandemic here in the Philippines. We have been in community quarantine since mid-March, and although restrictions to movements have been a bit eased now, movements are still limited and most of us are still physically distant from friends and family. As advocates for mental health, we know it is important to do our part in reminding everyone to look after our mental health as much as, as our physical health. So, together with other groups and individuals, we organized online activities and shared information aimed to provide community care during the pandemic. How did we do it and how significant are maps and OSM data in doing so? But first, what is community care? It's committing to being there for others and intentionally showing compassion. Community care is like the whole of society approach. So, whilst well, there need to be focused interventions with specific objectives and target groups, mental health and psychosocial support needs a whole of society approach. And this is where community care comes in. A whole of society approach requires addressing the mental health and psychosocial support needs of the entire affected population regardless of their affiliation, race, gender, or age. But as mere volunteers and citizens at home, we had to do our part to support others. So for mental health awareness, we developed mapping platforms that could encourage people to share their stories and be there for others who would be, need someone to listen to them to fight their mental health map. We made here here in mapping emotions 
and we used OpenStreetMap data as base maps for these maps. So for here, here, uh, people could add a pin to the location near to show where the nearest help is. And same with mapping emotions, so they could add a pin to share their locations to show people that um, mental health occupies space. And we also use these platforms to help students gain access to online learning because we know that not everyone can afford internet nowadays but most of the classes are done online because of the pandemic so we did a contest that encouraged students to share their stories by here here and mapping emotions and we selected uh, the best entries and the, the winners received mobile loads that they may use for mobile data to join their online classes we also emphasized coordination and shared knowledge and expertise through collaboration with other groups so um we recently had a mapathon and workshop which encouraged everyone to take care of their mental health and stay socially connected uh, despite being physically distant from each other and we have uh, these other um Program so collaborations with other groups, contests, and social media campaigns to promote mental health awareness, and of course, to support our goal in mental health awareness, to map mental health services in the Philippines, to support the need for to map existing mental health and psychosocial support during this pandemic. We did mapathons and workshops that encourage mental health volunteers to add data to, to our list of mental health services and resources which are separated per region and then map these services if they know their location on OpenStreetMap via our platform on MapContrib. So yeah, that's how we use the uh, mapping and OSM data for mental health awareness. Thank you. Stand by live uh and next up uh we have john bryant who is uh going to talk about extracts uh specifically of uh pacific island countries uh, uh from osm data i want to tell you about a small project i recently completed developing a resource for GIS users and map makers in the Pacific Islands with the aim of exposing more people in this region to OpenStreetMap and hopefully helping the local OSM community to grow. I'm not a resident of the Pacific Islands. I live in Australia. I grew up on Vancouver Island in Canada, which is technically an island in the Pacific. But when we talk about Pacific Islands in Oceania, what we usually mean is the Pacific Island countries and territories in the vast region between Eastern Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii. So I'm not necessarily qualified to speak with any authority about issues facing map makers in this region. But over the last two and a half years, I've been involved with organizing Phosphor-G State of the Map Oceania, and I've made a few friends in Pacific Island countries. Last November, I was fortunate enough to participate in the Phosphor-G State of the Map Oceania conference in New Zealand, and the Pacific GIS and Remote Sensing Conference in Fiji, and I had the chance to listen to the stories of Pacific GIS users. Some of the stories were about the problems mapmakers face in this huge, extremely remote and economically challenged region. Problems like limited budgets, limited opportunities for technical learning, and the difficulty of finding good data. In light of these difficulties, it's not surprising to find that people are very interested in open geospatial software and data. There's already some OSM community action in the Pacific, for example, in French Polynesia, where a very active group of people is engaged in community mapping projects. And certainly, many of the GIS people I've spoken to in the Pacific are interested in or curious about the project. But generally speaking, the OSM community is very small in the Pacific and usage is quite low. So if it's so useful, why isn't it getting used more? One possible reason is maybe Pacific mappers are used to a more GIS-centric workflow. If so, the question this project aims to address is, some people are accustomed to a GIS paradigm. What if there were a Pacific focused data resource that made it easier for them to start using OSM data? 
I've spent much of my career as a GIS user and map maker, downloading datasets based on themes like buildings, roads, and waterways, and using them as layers to build maps. When I first encountered OSM extracts, I found them hard to use because I had to filter and symbolize them using an unfamiliar tag schema, which can be difficult to adjust to if you're used to a different way of working. We thought maybe we could create a simple system that would do some of the preliminary work of filtering and symbolizing and provide GIS users with something in a more familiar format. We hope this project will help map makers over the initial hurdle of working with OSM data so they can discover not only how richly detailed it is, but also where the gaps are and maybe inspire some of them to become OSM editors and fill the gaps. It could provide a catalyst for people to join or start their own local OSM community and develop tagging guidelines that are relevant to their own lives and potentially emerge as members of the global OSM community, enriching the project with their unique perspectives. So how does it work? Technically, it's a fairly simple project, using a scripted workflow to fetch and process extracts from Geofabric and land polygons from FOSGIS, resulting in a set of user-friendly data resources. The project generates bundles of resources, automatically updated on a weekly basis. There's a bundle for each of 14 countries, plus one for the region with small file sizes for low bandwidth environments. Each bundle contains a geo package with thematic data layers familiar to tradi traditional desktop GIS users, a QGIS project and layer file with some basic cartography, and documentation about OpenStreetMap, how to use the data, and how to edit OSM. The data is updated every week, and the latest data is available here for the whole region, the Pacific Environment Portal. For each country as a single bundle, 14 country-specific data portals. The project is being launched in the coming days, and we're eager to find out if it helps increase the use of OSM in the Pacific. We'd love for you to check it out and let us know what you think. Thank you very much. And live. And next, um, uh, for those of you who were at State of the Map le last year, you might have seen the presentation about the Hiker app, an uh, augmented reality app for hikers. Uh, now Nick Whiteleg is back with uh, Hiker.js. Uh Hi, my name is Nick Whiteleg, uh, and I am a lecturer at uh, Southern University um, in Southampton in the south of the UK. Uh, I'm also a long time, uh, long term um, OpenStreetMap contributor and I'm here today to talk about um, Hikar.js bringing uh, Hikar, which is my augmented reality app, to the web. So a bit of background, uh, well Hikar is an Android based augmented reality app for walkers and hikers. Uh, and what it does, and you'll see some screenshots in a moment, is it overlays OpenStreetMap data uh, on the camera feed of your phone. So you can use that to help you navigate in the countryside because it will show you the footpaths, the hiking trails and where they go. And furthermore, as you'll also see in a minute, it shows virtual signposts and virtual notice boards on the camera feed. And I actually did talk about this last year at State of the Map uh, in Heidelberg and also at FOSDEM uh, in 2019 as well. OK, so just uh, some screenshots of the Hikar Android app. Uh, you can see four screenshots here. So uh, the uh, left two left screenshots were taken uh, climbing the highest peak in Northern Ireland. And you can see that the OpenStreetMap data is there in orange and blue, orange and green, sorry. And you can also see uh, these virtual signposts pointing the way to nearby points of interest. On the right hand side, uh, what you've got is a screenshot taken in the local park um, and it's showing you a virtual notice board. Now, these virtual notice boards can be added by users and it's telling you to be uh, aware of the blue green algae in the lake uh, around 80 metres uh, ahead of you. We did have that, that problem last summer. And you can also see there's a real footpath there, that sort of concrete path, and you can see the OpenStreetMap way is overlaid there in green. 
And then the bottom right, that is in the local national park, the New Forest, and it's showing you uh, the routing functionality of Highcar, and it's routing you to the nearby town of Brockenhurst. So the sort of uh, yellow colour is the uh, route that it's calculated. And again, you can see in the distance there a virtual signpost. OK, OK, so allowing me to port Highcar to the web, uh, I'm making use of a, a library called AR.js. So AR.js is an exciting project to bring AR to the web, uh, making use of HTML and JavaScript. It was started by a guy called Jerome Etienne um, and has recently been led by uh, another developer, Niccolo Carpignoli. And it's... Um, essentially 3.js and A-frame based. So as you may well know, 3.js and A-frame are standard APIs for um, doing 3D web development. So web development with 3D graphics. And they both essentially wrap um, WebGL. Uh, so the recent developments in AR.js from late last year. So AR.js was originally uh, a marker-based AR library but recently, um, location-based functionality has been added to it. So AR.js 3 now supports location-based AR as well as um, marker-based AR. And that makes it very exciting uh, and very useful for Hikar. Uh, a great thing about AR.js is it very has a very active community and a lot of contemporary interest. And here you can see, uh, here is its GitHub repository which you can take a look at while down there. Okay, so it seems to me, uh, you know, a, a very a very likely way forward is actually to port Highcar to the web, making use of AR.js. So currently Highcar works on Android only, uh, which is a bit of a limitation because there's no support for iOS or indeed any other mobile platforms. Uh, also, as I've just said, AR on Android away from the um, AR core official effort, uh, which is um, quite heavyweight and cloud based. Uh, there's not much development going on uh, in terms of independent, purely open source projects uh, on Android. AR.js is very different, as I've said, very active community. And if I uh, port Highcar to AR.js, it means there's already a, this community which could attract new contributors to the Highcar project. OK, so what is the progress so far? Well, there is a working demo actually available on the web at highcar.org slash web app. Uh, this will only work in Europe and uh, the non-European parts of Turkey, so the whole of Turkey. And the reason why that is, is that my server only hosts OpenStreetMap data um, in those areas, Europe and the whole of Turkey. However, if there is a lot of interest, I can add other small areas on request. So the working demo is equivalent to Highcar 0.1 in functionality. In other words, it does show OSM OpenStreetMap ways, uh, with different colours for roads and footpaths, uh, but the functionality for virtual signposts and virtual notice boards is not yet present. I would strongly recommend that you use Chrome if you're testing it out, as there are some quirks in Firefox. That is actually a known issue with AR.js as a whole. So what are the future plans? Well, the obvious future plan really is to make the Highcar web app equivalent in functionality to the Android app. In other words, to add signposts and virtual notice boards and also routing to a final destination. Now, because uh, web development is such a ubiquitous thing, uh, and there are lots of people involved in web-based projects, that will actually be significantly easier to add than for the Android, for the uh, native Android app, because there is a, a library available, GeoJSON Pathfinder, which actually does um, Dijkstra-based routing, and not just routing, but also graph generation um, using GeoJSON. So my own web API already provides OpenStreetMap data in GeoJSON, so I can convert that to a graph and then use GeoJSON Pathfinder to do the routing. And again, there is the GitHub repo for that. And uh, 
One of my future plans for uh, HiCar, which I've already mentioned in previous talks, is to use computer vision for better placement of uh, the, road, the footpaths and the, the trails. Uh, and there is, uh, I do feel that because there is a strong AR.js community anyway, uh, that's likely to lead to developments in this direction uh, across AR.js as a whole. Okay. Uh, so thanks for that. So any questions, um, my email is there and that is, uh, I've also provided the GitHub repository for uh, the uh, web version of HiCar. Okay, thanks. And now, finally, uh, we have Amitha Biju with a talk on Mapathon Kerala, uh, which is uh, being coordinated by the Kerala State IT Mission. Hi, I'm Amitha K. Biju, an undergraduate civil engineering student from Kerala, India. Today, I'm here to share my experience on OSM and OSM as a project in my state. I'm an NSS volunteer. Most of them don't know what is NSS. NSS is a national service scheme which was initiated by our government to promote volunteerism among our students and youth. Mr. Srirak V, the officer of NSS of our college, he conducted a workshop based on OSM and through him only I understand the basic concept of OSM. But I couldn't continue my work because of the unavailability of resources like laptop or computer. He only plotted some major parts of our college. Uh, it's on October 2019. But after the pandemic was widespread and the lockdown was declared, our uh, NSS team uh, decided to restart the uh, OSM project as a program for NSS. So we make a team of 25 to 30 likely many people who likes uh, mapping and we start to map as a team. After that, uh, it becomes a, uh, interesting like that we combat ourselves and it also become a personal interest as a way to kill my tedious days and I'm also excited for developing a new skill for me which may get collaborated with my civil engineering profession. And after that, uh, that where the all the NSS groups among the state, they start to make a group uh, for the mapping and they start to map from April onwards. Then the coordination team of the Mapathon Kerala, they contacted me and informed me that I'm in leading position among the NSS volunteer community. So I'm getting excited. Then only I know that all these NSS activities are undertaken as the part of a larger program by the Kerala IT mission that with the motto, Namu Kundaka Namada Bhubadam, or let us make our map. I'm getting super excited. All these initiatives of the Kerala IT mission came across due to a series of natural calamities uh, like we uh, in two, from 2017 onwards. We have Oki, the cyclone in 2017. We have flood in 2018 and 19. And now we have COVID. During the 2018-19 times, our Kerala or the state is immersed in water for four to five days. That is a positive situation. More than 600 were died, more than 35,000 of um, them were evacuated, and many of them lost their livelihood. This event was brought a realization that climate change mitigations and also that rethinking the development model is one of the important steps for Kerala future development. The important step to mitigate the disaster is having a proper spatial data information and also having a planned system based on the spatial data. So this requires a lot of data generation. Here comes the importance of or the foundation of Mapathon Kerala. Mapathon Kerala, it was launched by the Chief Minister uh, in October 2019 and it was coordinated by the Kerala State IT Mission with the concept of let us make our map. This, uh, using this, the project involves uh, mainly crowdsourcing and they are using the adoption of crowdsource with the government and they use and generate open data. They are also mobilizing local community and making a partnership with citizen and state. During the COVID, the Mapathon attracted more than 2,000 volunteers or 2,000 mappers and we plot more than 220,000 of buildings, 18,540 kilometers of street network, more than 8,000 kilometers of road network and more than 27,500 of assets. It is one of the biggest achievements that the, that the voice of or the uh, Mapathon have. 
Now also the Kerala IT mission contact us or mentors are all the volunteers including me and they teach us the new tools like Josam because they want to share this uh, knowledge to everyone and make a larger mapa community. So I am so confident that my small deeds can make huge difference in the society especially in the most challenged phase uh, situation in humanity now that is the climate change. So I am happy that I am a part of OSM and a part of Mapathon Kerala. Thank you. And uh, now uh, we uh, will move on to the Q and A. Uh, so, um, if you are in our hackpad, you will see that uh, some of our speakers are in there and have been answering questions. Um, so, uh, a question for uh, divide and map by uh, jury. Uh, the, the question was, uh, why did you pick Postgres instead of MySQL? Uh, and the answer was uh, due to the Postgres GI, uh, the PostGIS uh, extension, um, because a lot can be done just by the query. Uh, for DDD123 OSM, um, there, has uh, there's been added uh, some information um, about uh, how to get involved um, with that project. Um, and uh, there will perhaps be in the future um, an online map, uh, but uh, global coverage is uh, pretty far on the roadmap. Um, with respect to Hot Tasking Manager 4, uh, somebody asked, uh, do users uh, need to allow third-party cookies? And the response is, it is optional to allow cookies. Uh, the data from the cookies uh, is used only to provide uh, hot with stat statistics about the usage of the tools. Um, and they use their own analytics instance, so no data is shared with third parties, uh, but you can uh, turn that off if you want. Um, for uh, Hikar, there is, uh, the question is if there is a F-Droid version planned, um, and an uh, answer is the native Android app could uh, go on F-Droid, uh, but the talk is uh, related to a browser-based app. And uh, then there is some uh, further discussion um, about uh, specific uh, issues that uh, people are encountering in testing uh, testing that out. Um, so if you have questions uh, for our speakers, I know that um, with the lightning talks, uh, we have speakers from all parts of the world. So many of them are probably not awake right now. Uh, you can post your question in the hack pad and uh, the speakers hopefully will be able to respond uh, in the document. And uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, we're now going to a meal break and we will return uh, in one hour.